Section 20 of Lives of the Ancient Philosophers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by Francois Fenelon. Section 20. Antisthenes, a disciple of Socrates and contemporary with Plato and the other disciples of Socrates. The disciples of Socrates divided after the death of their master into three distinct sects, the Cynic, the Academic, and the Cyrenaic. Antisthenes was the leader of the Cynics. Different reasons have been assigned for these philosophers being distinguished by this appellation. Some say it was because they lived like dogs, and others that it was on account of the place where Antisthenes taught, being near one of the harbours of Athens, which was called Sinosarges. Antisthenes was the son of an Athenian of the same name. His mother was a slave. He was one day reproached with the circumstance of her being a Phrygian. Of what consequence is it, said he, did not the same country give birth to Cybele, the mother of all the gods? He was at first a disciple of the orator Georgius. He afterwards formed a school of his own, and taught for some time, his powerful eloquence attracting a crowd of hearers from all parts. Being induced, however, by the great reputation of Socrates to go and hear him, he was so charmed with that philosopher that he took all his own disciples likewise to hear him, and, resolving no longer to assume the office of a teacher himself, he entreated them all to join him in attending the instructions of Socrates. For this purpose he took up his residence at the Piraeus, and walked forty stadia every day, to see and hear the philosopher to whom he had so warmly attached himself. Antisthenes was a man of austere manners, and of the simplest habits. He prayed the gods to visit him with madness, rather than with fondness for sensual pleasures. He treated his scholars with severity, and being asked the reason of his doing so, Do not physicians, he replied, treat their patients in the same manner? He was the first among his sect who made use of a large cloak, a staff, and bag, which were afterwards adopted by the cynics as their sole movables, and the only wealth which they desired, in order to dispute felicity with Jupiter himself. He suffered his beard to grow without ever trimming it, and was altogether negligent of his appearance. He applied himself exclusively to morality, saying that all other sciences were utterly useless. Indeed, he placed the sovereign good in following virtue and condemning luxury. The cynics were very austere in their general modes of life. Their ordinary diet consisted of fruits and vegetables. They drank nothing but water, and threw themselves without ceremony on the earth for a bed. It is the privilege of the gods, they used to say, to be without wants, and he who has the fewest approaches the nearest to them in their divine nature. They boasted of their contempt of riches, nobility, and all other advantages of nature or fortune. They, moreover, were possessed of so great a degree of effrontery that they were ashamed of nothing, however infamous it might be. They disclaimed politeness and respected no one. Notwithstanding all this, the vivacity of Antisthenes' understanding and the agreeableness of his manners enabled him, whenever he went into company, to gain every one over to his opinions. He evinced his courage at the Battle of Tanagra, where he greatly signalized himself. Socrates was much rejoiced at this, and when some one afterwards, by way of depreciating Antisthenes, remarked that his mother was a Phrygian, What, said he, did you expect so brave a man could have had Athenians on both sides for his parents? Nevertheless, he himself could not refrain one day from upbraiding Antisthenes with his pride. He saw him turning his cloak so as to make an ostentatious display of a rent in it. O oh, Antisthenes, exclaimed he, I can see your vanity through the hole in your cloak. Antisthenes, finding that the Athenians piqued themselves upon being the original inhabitants of the country in which they then lived, laughingly told them that in that respect they resembled tortoises and periwinkles which always ended their lives in the spot where they commenced them. He used to say that the most essential science to learn was to unlearn evil. One day a man came to him with his son, wishing to introduce him to be one of the disciples of Antisthenes. What does my son stand in most immediate need of? he asked. A new book, a new pen, and new tablets, answered Antisthenes. 
thus giving him to understand that the mind of his son ought to be as virgin wax, on which no mark had yet been impressed. Being asked what was the most desirable thing in life, he replied, a happy death. He was angry at those envious people who seemed to be devoured by their own spleen, as iron is eaten by the rust which it produces. He said that were the choice forced upon him, he would prefer being a raven to being of an envious disposition, for that ravens only mangled the dead, but the envious preyed upon the living. Some one remarking that war carried off many unhappy wretches. That may be, he replied, but it makes many more than it carries off. Being urged to give some idea of the divinity, he replied that as there was no being that any way resembled him, it would be folly to attempt to make him known by any description addressed to the senses. He maintained that enemies ought to be respected, because as they are the first to discover faults, so they are the first to publish them, in which case they are of more real value to us than even our friends can be. On the same principle he held that a judicious friend ought to be estimated more highly than a relation, the ties of virtue being stronger than those of blood, and that it was more desirable to form one of a few wise men against a multitude of fools than one of a multitude of fools against a few wise men. Hearing himself praised one day by some men of bad character, Good gods, he exclaimed, what have I done amiss? He deemed it incumbent on a wise man to regulate his conduct by the laws of virtue rather than by those of a government, and to be astonished at nothing, and find nothing disagreeable to him, because he ought to foresee every event long before it happens, and to be prepared for it accordingly. Nobility and wisdom, he said, were the same things, and consequently he allowed none to be truly noble but the wise. Prudence he compared to a fortress, which can neither be surprised nor stormed. A pious life he held to be the best foundation for immorality, and that resources such as Socrates possessed were sufficient in themselves to ensure contentment. A man once thought fit to ask him what sort of a wife he ought to take. If you choose an ugly woman, said he, you will not like her yourself. If you choose a handsome one, others will like her, as well as you do. He saw one day an adulterer flying from pursuit. Unhappy wretch, he exclaimed, how many dangers you might have escaped for a shilling. He advised his disciples to store themselves with such goods as no storm of fortune should be able to wreck. If he found he had an enemy, he would wish him all sorts of possessions except wisdom. If any one spoke to him of a life of pleasure, grant ye gods, he would exclaim, such pleasure to none but the children of our enemies. Whenever he saw a female elegantly attired, he always went immediately to her house, and requested her husband to let him see his horse and his arms. If he found them in proper condition, he allowed the lady to do as she pleased, knowing that her husband was able to protect her. But if he found them, on the contrary, not according with her appearance, he used to counsel her to lay aside all her ornaments, lest she should fall a victim to the first man who might offer violence to her. He advised the Athenians one day to yoke horses and asses indiscriminately to the plough. He was answered that it would not be proper to do so, for that asses were unfit for the labours of husbandry. What of that, returned Antisthenes, when you elect magistrates, do you consider whether they are fit to govern or not? No, it is enough for you and for them that they are chosen. Being told that Plato had spoken ill of him, he replied, It happens to me as to princes that I receive injuries in return for benefits. It is ridiculous, said he, to take so much pains to separate tares from wheat and to rid the army of soldiers that are only burdensome to it, whilst we take no care to purge the state of the envious and malignant. He was reproached once with visiting persons of immoral conduct. Why not, said he, do not physicians every day visit the sick without catching their disorders? Antisthenes was extremely patient and always advised his disciples to bear without resentment whatever injuries might be offered them. He blamed Plato greatly for his love of pomp and grandeur and never failed to rally him respecting it. Being asked, what advantage had accrued to himself from his philosophy? The advantage, he replied, 
of being able to converse with myself, and of doing from inclination what others do by compulsion. Towards Socrates, his master, Antisthenes always felt the liveliest gratitude, and it should even seem that it was he who avenged the death of that philosopher. For several persons having come from the most distant borders of the Pontus Euxinus to hear him, Antisthenes conducted them to Anites. There, said he to them, behold a man wiser than Socrates himself, for this is his accuser. So powerful was the recollection of Socrates at that moment in the minds of all present, that they immediately drove Anites out of the city, and seizing Miletus, the other accuser of Socrates, put him to death. Antisthenes fell ill of a pulmonary complaint, but it should seem that he preferred a lingering disease to a speedy death, for his disciple Diogenes came into his room one day with a poniard under his cloak, and on his master's exclaiming, What can I do to cure the anguish I suffer? Use this, said Diogenes, offering him the poniard. I want to get rid of my disorder and not of my life, replied Antisthenes. It appears that this philosopher boasted of Hercules being the founder of the sect of cynics, for the poet Osonius, in his epigrams, makes him speak thus. Inventur primus cynicus ego curatio istic, Alcides multo dicitur esse prior, Alcide quondam fuerum doctore secundus, nunc ego sum cynicus primus et ille deus. The cynic doctrines were in ancient days by great Alcides taught, but now a god, he leaves to me the wreath of cynic bays, no longer second in the path he trod. End of section 20「Section twenty one of Lives of the Ancient Philosophers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Ancient Philosopher by Francois Fenelon. Section twenty one. Aristippus. Aristippus, contemporary with Plato and lived in the sixty-ninth Olympiad. Aristippus was originally from Cyrene in Libya. He was induced to leave his native country and settle at Athens in order to enjoy the pleasure of listening to Socrates, of whose great reputation he was continually hearing. He became one of the principal disciples of that philosopher, though his conduct was very opposite to the precepts imparted to him in this excellent school from him the sect which he formed was called cyreniac from cyrene his native city aristippus had a brilliant imagination and a lively wit his conversation was agreeable and abounded with well-timed pleasantries even on the most trifling topics his chief aim was to flatter kings and persons of rank he was always ready to lend himself to their wishes he made them laugh, and under the semblance of a jest drew from them whatever he wished. If they insulted or reproached him, he turned it into a matter of raillery, so that they found it impossible to quarrel with him, even if they wished to. He was so clever and insinuating that he always succeeded, with the utmost ease to himself, in everything he undertook and so happy was his temper that he retained without effort the utmost equality of mind in whatever circumstances he might be placed plato sometimes said to him there is not a man in the world aristippus except yourself who can wear old rags with as good a grace as if they were robes of the most magnificent purple horace says of this philosopher that he could assume any character he pleased and was always contented with the little he possessed, even at the moment that he was seeking to make it more. These qualities recommended him greatly to Dionysius the tyrant, who set more store by him than all the rest of his courtiers. Aristippus often went to Syracuse to enjoy himself at the table of Dionysius, and when he grew weary of the sameness of it, he varied the scene by going to the houses of other great personages thus passing his life between one court and another, for which he was never spoken of by Diogenes the Cynic under any other appellation than that of the royal dog. One day Dionysius spit in his face. 
by which some of the company were considerably disconcerted but aristippus laughed at their uneasiness saying i should indeed want something to complain of fishermen suffer themselves to be wet to the skin in the hope of catching a small fish and if i want to catch a whale i need only suffer a little saliva to be thrown in my face dionysius being displeased with him on another occasion pointed out the lowest place to him when they were about to sit down to table you intend then to make this the place of honour said aristippus no way put out of countenance at the affront aristippus was the first of socrates disciples who extracted any reward for the instructions he might communicate and in order to gain a precedent for his conduct he sent twenty minae or about sixty pounds sterling to socrates himself socrates however not only refused the money but resented the offer of it ever afterwards a circumstance which did not appear to give aristippus the smallest regret when any one reproached him with his behavior in this respect and contrasted it with the disinterestedness of his master who never required reward from any person that is another matter he would reply all the great men of athens rejoice in an opportunity of ministering to the wants of socrates insomuch that he is often obliged to send back a good part of what is actually forced upon him whilst as to myself i have scarcely a rascally slave to care a farthing about me a man brought his son to him one day to be instructed by him and begged that he would take particular care of him for this care aristippus demanded fifty drachmas how replied the father fifty drachmas why with that i could buy a slave do then retorted aristippus in that case you will have a pair we are not however to infer from this that aristippus was a miser on the contrary he wished for money only that he might spend it and show others the use that ought to be made of it being at sea once he was told that the vessel on board which he was belonged to pirates on hearing this he pulled all his money out of his pocket and whilst apparently engaged in counting it he let it purposely fall into the sea he heaved a deep sigh as if the bag had accidentally dropped out of his hands but at the same time he said in a low voice better for aristippus to lose his money than for his money to lose aristippus another time seeing that his slave who was following him could not keep up with him on account of a load of money which he was carrying throw some of it away he said if it be too heavy and only keep what you can carry with ease chorus speaking of persons who place their sole consequence in their wealth advises them occasionally to imitate the conduct of aristippus in this instance aristippus was fond of good living and spared no expense to procure a delicacy one day he paid fifty drachmas for a partridge one of his friends could not refrain from censuring him for what appeared to him an act of shameful extravagance if it had cost you only an abolus you would have bought it yourself i suppose said aristippus very likely so replied the other well then returned aristippus i value fifty drachmas still less than you value a single obolus at another time he bought some rarities at a high price and a person who was present took upon himself to reprimand him accordingly would not you give three aboli for them asked aristippus certainly replied the other then returned aristippus i am not so much of an epicure as you are of a miser being reproached with his luxurious way of living he replied that if there were any harm in good cheer there would not be such magnificent entertainments at the festivals of the gods even plato whose own modes of life were sufficiently splendid could not help warning him against falling into habits of too much indulgence do you think dionysius a virtuous man asked aristippus i do replied plato well said aristippus he lives far more luxuriously than i do it shows therefore that habits of indulgence are no way inimical to virtuous principles diogenes was one day washing herbs according to his usual custom at that moment aristippus happened to pass by 
if you knew how to content yourself with herbs as i do said diogenes you would trouble yourself very little about paying court to princes and if you had the art of paying court to princes replied aristippus you would soon find your herbs not quite so savoury dionysius one day presented three ladies to aristippus telling him he might take his choice of them aristippus took them all three saying choice may err you well know the ills that paris drew upon himself by his choice the two that i should leave may work me more mischief than the one that i might take could ever do me good accordingly he led the ladies as far as the vestibule and then immediately sent them back to their own houses at another time dionysius asked him how it came to pass that philosophers are always to be found in the abode of princes but that princes are never found in the abode of philosophers it is because philosophers know what they are in want of and princes do not replied aristippus being asked the same question by another person he answered by remarking that we see physicians for the sick and we find no one who would not rather prescribe for a sick person than be sick himself it is good he would say to prune the passions but not to tear them up by the roots there is no crime in gratifying the senses provided we do not suffer ourselves to be enslaved by them it was according to this view of his subject that when rallied on his acquaintance with the courtesan laius he said it is true that i possess laius but laius does not possess me he was one day in the act of entering the residence of this celebrated female when one of his disciples happening to go past at that moment saw him and blushed aristippus perceived it and said to him there is no reason to be ashamed my friend of going into the house of this kind it is not being able to leave it again that we ought to be ashamed of the philosopher polyzenus came to see him and the first thing he perceived on entering the room was a magnificent entertainment and a great number of ladies splendidly dressed he immediately fell into a transport of indignation and began to exclaim against such abominable luxury aristippus asked him very good-humouredly if he would not sit down at table with them with all my heart replied the philosopher why then said aristippus have you wasted so much breath on the matter it seems that it is neither the company nor the good cheer that you object to it therefore can only be at the expense aristippus had had a dispute with eschines which had left such a coldness between them that they could not see each other for a considerable length of time at last aristippus went to the house of eschines well he said to him are we never to make up our quarrels or are we to wait till anybody laughs at us and parasites make their entertainers merry at our expense it gives me the greatest pleasure to see you again replied ischines and i am most willing to be reconciled to you well then said aristippus bear it in mind that i have paid you the first visit although i am your senior dionysius one day gave a splendid entertainment at the close of which he desired each of the guests to clothe himself in a loose purple robe and take his part in a dance in the middle of the hall plato refused to do either saying that he was a man and that therefore so effeminate a dress was unworthy of him aristippus however raised no difficulties he put on his robe and began to dance about saying gaily we do worse things than these at the festivals of bacchus yet no one is corrupted there if he had not been corrupted before having once to intercede with dionysius for one of his best friends the tyrant not being in a humour to comply with his request repulsed him with severity aristippus instantly drew himself to his feet to some the act appeared to savour of psychophancy it is not my fault said aristippus but dionysius's for carrying his ears in his sandals whilst aristippus was at syracuse simus a phrygian and treasurer to dionysius showed him his superb palace and particularly direct his attention to the magnificence of the floors aristippus immediately fell a coughing and then spit in the face of simus who very naturally felt extremely angry with him my good friend said aristippus i saw no other place dirty enough for me to venture to spit upon 
by some this adventure or one very like it is attributed to diogenes they were either of them capable of it a man one day began to abuse aristippus violently the philosopher took to his heels his enemy pursued him crying out to him what you run away you cowardly miscreant do you i do replied aristippus because you have the faculty of pouring out abuse and i have not the faculty of listening to it aristippus was once on his passage to corinth when a furious tempest suddenly arose and put him into a terrible fright some of the passengers on board could not help laughing at his alarm we ignoramuses said they are afraid of nothing and you philosophers are all on a tremble we are not all concerned alike said aristippus there is a great deal of difference between the wise and the ignorant in what they have to lose being asked what the difference really was between the wise man and an ignorant one he answered strip them both naked and turn them adrift among strangers and you will soon discover the difference he thought it far more desirable to be poor than ignorant because the poor man might be deficient only in money the other in everything that gave value to a human being insomuch that one was like a horse that had never been broken and the other like one accustomed to be menage being reproached with neglecting his son and casting him off as if he had not been of his own generating we all know that we generate vermin and phlegm he said but i do not find that we are less anxious to get rid of them on that account one day dionysius made a present of money to aristippus and of books to plato some of the bystanders wished from this distinction to draw an inference to the disadvantage of aristippus he replied i stand in need of money and plato stands in need of books another time aristippus requested dionysius to give him a talent how is this asked dionysius you once told me that wise men never wanted money first give me the talent replied aristippus then we will discuss the matter dionysius accordingly gave him one and then continued well it is as i have said you see i am not in need of money as aristippus went very often to syracuse dionysius took it into his head one day to ask him what he came for i come said aristippus to impart to you what i possess and to receive from you what you possess being reproached with leaving socrates in order to pay his court to dionysius when i required wisdom said he i went to socrates now that i require money i go to dionysius are you not ashamed said he to a young man who was proud of his swimming to value yourself on such a trifle every dolphin can swim much better than you can being asked what benefit he derived from his philosophy that of being able to speak freely to men in all conditions replied he upon another occasion being pressed to state the advantage which philosophers possess over other persons he replied that with laws or without they would live exactly in the same manner the cyreniacs attached themselves almost exclusively to morality and very little to logic to physics they paid no attention because they did not believe it possible to attain any positive knowledge of them they held the end of human actions to be pleasure not merely exemption from pain but a positive pleasure consisting in motion they admitted two different kinds of movement in the soul one calm which constituted pleasure the other violent which constituted pain as all mankind have an instinctive love of pleasure and aversion from pain they draw the inference that pleasure is the end and aim of all human existence a state of inaction they consider as synonymous with one of sleep which could be classed under the head neither of pleasure nor of pain virtue they regarded as a mere physical good insomuch as the exercise of it is connected with pleasure thus considering it only as a medicine which is valued so far as it contributes to health and no more happiness they said differed from pleasure in this respect that pleasure as resulting from any human action was only in consequence of some particular view of action to which it was confined whereas happiness was an assemblage of all the pleasures combined 
they considered the pleasures of the body as much more certain than those of the mind and hence they paid much more attention to one than the other even with respect to friendship they held that it was only desirable to cultivate it because we might occasionally require the assistance of friends and that they ought like the members of the body to be valued only in proportion as they were useful to us they maintained likewise that there was not any action that could be deemed just or unjust virtuous or vicious in itself but that it appeared either one or the other according as it might have relations to the laws and customs of a country that a wise man ought not to commit a wrong action because he ought to consider the consequences that might result from it and that on the same principle he ought always to conform himself to the laws of the country which he might inhabit and to avoid everything that might tend to cast a shade upon his reputation this sect likewise held that there was not any thing either agreeable or disagreeable in itself and that things appear so only with relation to their novelty frequency or in short any other circumstance that makes them seem so to us that it is impossible to be perfectly happy in this world because the thousand passions and infirmities to which we are subjected either rob us entirely of pleasure or at least disturb us in the enjoyment of it that neither liberty nor slavery riches nor poverty rank nor humble birth have any influence on happiness and that it is possible to be equally happy in any condition that a wise man ought to endeavour to instruct any one and to hate no one but that he ought in everything he does to pay due attention to himself no one being more worthy of every good his wisdom in fact rendering him a far more value than anything else in the world had to offer such were the sentiments of aristippus and the cyrenaics in general aristippus had one daughter named arita he educated her with great care in his own principles and she became so well informed in them that she instructed her own son aristippus who was on that account named metrodidactus or taught by his mother he became the master of theodorus the impious this detestable man in addition to the general principles of the cynics taught publicly that there was no god and that friendship was a mere chimera as it could not exist among fools and the wise did not require its aid being in all things sufficient to themselves that a wise man was not called upon to risk his personal safety for his native country as the world at large was the only country he acknowledged and that in point of justice it was not right to hazard the life of a man of that description in defence of a number of fools that a philosopher might commit theft sacrilege or adultery whenever a favourable opportunity of doing so presented itself and that such acts were crimes only in the opinion of the vulgar and unenlightened there not being in fact any such thing as evil and in short that he might do those things publicly which were accounted most infamous by the people in general theodorus expected on one occasion to be taken before the areopagus but he was saved by demetrius phalerius he remained some time at cyrene where he was treated with great consideration by marius but he was at last banished by the cyrenians when he was taking his departure he said to them you know not what you do in sending me from libya an exile into greece he took refuge in the court of ptolemy lagus who once sent him in the capacity of ambassador to lysimachus in this character he expressed himself with such undaunted effrontery that the minister of lysimachus said to him i suppose theodorus you imagine that there are no kings as well as no gods the philosopher was according to amphicrates at last condemned to death and forced to drink poison of the death of aristippus the original promulgator of principles so fraught with evil in their consequences no particulars are known End of section 21section 22 of lives of the ancient philosophers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by maya 
Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by François Fenelon Aristotle Born the first year of the 91st Olympiad, died the third year of the 114th, aged 63 years. Aristotle was one of the most illustrious philosophers of antiquity, and his name is to this day celebrated in all schools. He was the son of Nicomachus, physician and friend of Armintas, king of Macedon, and descended from Macaon, grandson of Esculapius. He was born in the first year of the 91st Olympiad at Stagira, a city of macedonia he lost his father and mother in the early part of his infancy and was greatly neglected by those who had the charge of his education hence part of his youth was passed in libertinism and debauchery in which he spent almost all his fortune he first took up arms but as that profession was not agreeable to his inclinations he went to delphos to consult the oracle to know to what he should apply himself the oracle ordered him to go to athens and study philosophy he was then in his eighteenth year he studied during twenty years in the academy under plato and as he had already dissipated all his property, he was obliged for subsistence to trade in certain drugs, which he himself sold in Athens. Aristotle ate little and slept still less. He had so great a passion for study that to resist the heaviness of sleep, he always put a copper basin by his bedside and when he lay down he extended one of his hands which held a ball of iron over it so that when he was inclined to sleep the ball fell into the basin and awoke him directly laertius says he had a shrill voice small eyes and slender legs and that he always dressed magnificently Aristotle was possessed of keen wit and easily understood the most difficult questions. He was not long before he became clever in the school of Plato and distinguished himself above all the other academicians. They decided no questions in the academy without consulting him, though he did not always coincide with Plato all the other disciples regarded him as an extraordinary genius some even followed his opinion to the prejudice of those of their master aristotle having withdrawn himself from the academy plato felt some resentment and could not help treating him as a rebel complaining that his pupil had resisted against him as a young colt kicks against its mother the athenians sent aristotle as their ambassador to king philip father of alexander the great the affairs of the athenians detained him some time in macedonia and on his return he found xenocrates had been elected to instruct in the academy when aristotle saw that this place was filled he said that he should be ashamed if he remained silent when xenocrates spoke he instituted a new sect and taught a different doctrine to that which he had learned from plato his master the great reputation aristotle had acquired by excelling in all the sciences and particularly in philosophy and politics made philip king of macedon wish to have him as preceptor to his son alexander who was at that time fourteen years of age aristotle accepted this trust 
and lived eight years with alexander to whom he taught as plutarch relates certain secret knowledge which he communicated to no other person the study of philosophy had not rendered aristotle austere he applied himself to business and had a great share in all that passed during his residence at the court of macedonia king philip through respect for him rebuilt stagira the country of this philosopher which had been destroyed during the wars and restored the inhabitants some of whom had been made slaves and the others had fled aristotle after leaving alexander came to athens where he was well received because king philip through steam for him had granted many favors to the athenians he chose a place in the lyceum with beautiful walks it was there he established his new school and because he generally taught his pupils while walking with them his followers were known by the name of peripatetics the lyceum soon became highly celebrated on account of the great concourse of people who assembled from several places to hear aristotle whose reputation was spread through all greece alexander advised aristotle to apply himself to making experiments in physic he sent him a great number of huntsmen and fishermen to bring from all parts subjects for his observations and sent him eight hundred talents to pay the expenses he might incur in his pursuit it was at this time that aristotle published his books on physics and metaphysics alexander who had passed through asia heard them much spoken of this ambitious prince who wished to be in all things the greatest man in the world was angry that the science of aristotle was becoming common and showed his displeasure in a letter which he wrote in these terms alexander to aristotle you have not done right in publishing your book on speculative sciences because now we shall have nothing above others if what you have taught us in private is to be communicated to every one else i wish you to understand that i should prefer being superior to others in higher matters to surpassing them in mere power aristotle to appease this prince replied that although he had brought this knowledge to light he had not published the method by which it was to be acquired meaning to say that he had wrapped his doctrines in so much mystery that nobody would ever be able to comprehend them aristotle did not always keep in alexander's favor he embroiled himself with him in consequence of having espoused with too much warmth the part of callisthenes the philosopher this callisthenes was the great nephew of aristotle son of his own niece aristotle had brought him up with alexander who always took an interest in his education when he quitted alexander he left to him this nephew to follow him in his expeditions and recommended him very particularly to his care callisthenes spoke with great freedom to the king towards whom his humour was not generally very complaisant it was callisthenes who prevented the macedonians from worshipping alexander as a god in the manner of the persians alexander who hated him on account of his inflexible temper found occasion to avenge himself by destroying him 
he involved him in the conspiracy of Ermolaus, the disciple of Callisthenes, and would not allow him to defend himself. By some, he said to have been exposed to lions. By others, that he was hanged. And others assert that he expired by torture. Aristotle, after the punishment of Callisthenes, always retained a lively resentment against Alexander, who, on his side, tried by all the means he could to vex Aristotle. He promoted Xenocrates and sent him considerable presents. Aristotle entertained great jealousy of this philosopher. Some, however, accused him of having had a hand in the conspiracy of Antipater, and to have given him a hint towards the composition of that poison, by which it is suspected that Alexander perished. Aristotle, though generally firm, could not help occasionally letting some of his weaknesses appear. Some time after he had quitted the academy, he retired to the court of Hermias, tyrant of Atarnia. It is not precisely known what attracted him there, but it has been asserted that he had some gross libertinism for his object. Aristotle married the sister, or, as some say, the concubine of this prince. He allowed himself to be transported by his violent passion for this woman, to the greatest degree of folly, insomuch that he sacrificed to her, as the Athenians did to Eleusinian Ceres, and composed verses in honor of Hermias in gratitude to him for allowing this marriage. Aristotle divided his philosophy into theory and practice. Practical philosophy is that which either teaches us the proper way of regulating the operations of mind, as logic, or that which gives us maxims to conduct ourselves in civil life, as morals, and politics theoretical philosophy is that which discovers facts purely speculative as physics and metaphysics there are according to aristotle three principles of natural bodies privation matter and form to prove that privation ought to be considered in the rank of principle he says that the matter of which a thing is made must have the privation of the form of that thing. For example, the matter of which a table is made must have the privation of the form of a table. That is to say, before making a table, the matter of which it is made must be not a table. He did not consider privation as a principle in the composition of bodies, but as an external property in their production. So far as the production is a change by which the matter passes from the state it had not to that which it acquires. As, for example, blanks, which pass from not being tables to be tables aristotle gives us two definitions of matter one of which is negative the first matter he says is that which is neither substance nor extension nor quality nor any other kind of existence so, according to him, the matter of wood is neither its extension, nor its figure, nor its color, nor its solidity, nor its weight, nor its hardness, nor its dryness, nor its dampness, nor its smell, 
nor indeed any of the accidents of wood the other definition is affirmative and is as little satisfactory as the former he says that matter is that substance of which a body is composed and into which it finally resolves but of what substance the works of nature are composed we are still to learn this philosophy teaches that besides this original matter to complete a body another principle which he calls form is necessary some think that by this he means nothing but a certain disposition of parts others maintain that he means a substantial being really distinct from matter for example when in grinding corn a new substantial form is produced by which the corn becomes flour after having mixed the flour with water and kneaded it together that there is another substantial form superseded which is dough and in the same manner that finally this dough when baked gives rise to another form which we call bread this doctrine assigns a place to these forms in all natural bodies thus in a horse besides the bones the flesh the nerves the brains the blood which by circulating through the veins and arteries nourishes all parts and besides the animal spirits which are the principles of motion they allowed a substantial form which was the horse's soul they maintained that this pretended form was not drawn from the matter but from the power of matter meaning that it was quite distinct from matter of which it is neither part nor even modification aristotle holds that there are four elements and that all terrestrial bodies are formed from these earth water air and fire that earth and water are heavy tending to the centre of the world air and fire are light and have an inclination to fly off from the centre besides these four elements he has admitted a fifth of which the celestial bodies are composed and the movements of which are always circular he thought that above the air under the conclave of the moon there was a sphere of fire to which all flame rises as brooks and rivers flow into the sea aristotle maintained the infinite indivisibility of matter that the universe is full and that there is no void in nature that the world is eternal that the sun has always revolved as it does at present and that it will always do the same that one generation of men has always produced another without ever having a beginning if there had been a first man said he he must have been born without father or mother which is repugnant to nature he makes the same observation with respect to birds he says it is impossible that there could have been a first egg to give the beginning to birds or that there should have been a first bird which gave the beginning to eggs for a bird comes from an egg he reasoned in the same manner of other species or beings which people the world he maintained that the heavens are incorruptible and that although 
sublunary things are subject to dissolution nevertheless they do not perish but are liable to change places only and that of the remains of one thing another is formed and therefore the mass of the world always remains whole he says the earth is in the center of the universe and that the first being moved the heavens round the earth by means of intelligences which are perpetually occupied in his movements that all which is at this time sea was formerly land and that what now is land was once sea the reason he gives for this opinion is that rivers and torrents are continually carrying with them sands and earth which make the shores advance by degrees and that the sea retires insensibly that consequently these changes from land to sea and sea to land will be formed after innumerable ages he adds that in several places which are a great way from the sea and even those which are very much elevated the sea in retiring has left some of its shells and in digging deep in the earth we sometimes find anchors and remains of vessels ovid attributes this same sentiment to pythagoras also aristotle asserts that these changes from sea into land and land into sea which are imperceptible and which take place during a long succession of time are in great part the cause of the history of former ages being lost he adds that there are other accidents likewise by which the arts are lost these accidents are either plagues wars earthquakes conflagrations or such other desolations as exterminate and destroy the inhabitants of a country unless some of them escape to deserts where they pass a savage life and where they give birth to other men who in process of time cultivate the land and discover or invent the arts and thus the same opinions are renewed and have been renewed times without number it is thus he maintains that notwithstanding these vicissitudes and revolutions the universe continues incorruptible aristotle examines carefully the great question of what can render men happy in this world he refutes the opinion of the voluptuous who made happiness to consist in corporeal pleasures he says that these pleasures are not of any duration and that they cause disgust weaken the body and debase the mind he rejects the opinion of the ambitious who place happiness in honors and who to arrive at it employ all kinds of unjust means he says that honor is in him who honors he adds that the ambitious are anxious to be honored for some virtue they wish people to think they possess that consequently felicity consists in virtue rather than in honors inasmuch as the latter do not depend upon ourselves he refutes in the last place the opinion of the avaricious who put their felicity in riches wealth he said is not desirable on its own account it makes him unhappy who has it because he is afraid to use it yet in order to render it really serviceable it is necessary to use it and not to estimate too highly what is in itself contemptible 
instead of which felicity ought to consist in something fixed which we ought to reserve and secure aristotle's opinion is that felicity consists in the most perfect exercise of the understanding he considers the most noble exercise of the understanding to be speculations concerning natural things the stars the heavens and principally the first being he observed nevertheless that it is impossible to be entirely happy without having a competency suited to a man's condition because without this we have not leisure to pursue or to practice virtue for example we cannot give pleasure to friends and to benefit those whom we love is one of the highest enjoyments he says happiness depends on three things the benefits of the mind as wisdom and prudence the benefits of the body as beauty health and strength and the benefits of fortune as riches and nobility he shows that virtue is not sufficient to render men happy and that wealth and health are absolutely necessary to happiness in this life for that even a wise man would be unhappy if he were to suffer and be in want of money he affirms on the other hand that vice is sufficient to render men miserable and though a man have great wealth and enjoy every advantage he can never be happy as long as he abandons himself to vice that the wise are not exempt from troubles but that they are comparatively light to them that vices and virtues are not incompatible that the same man for example may be very just and prudent though he may likewise be very intemperate he admits three kinds of friendship one of kindred another of inclination and the other of hospitality he says justly that the refinements of literature contribute greatly to produce virtue and ensure the greatest consolation to old age he admits like plato a supreme being to whom he attributes providence he maintains that all our ideas came originally from sense that a man born blind cannot have the conception of colors any more than a deaf one can of the notion of sound he also maintained in his politics that the monarchical state is the most perfect because in the others there are several who govern just the same as an army which is conducted by one able chief succeeds much better than that which is commanded by a number it is just the same he observes with the state whilst deputies or the principles of a republic employ their time in assembling and deliberating a monarch has already taken places and executed his designs the rulers of a republic do not mind ruining it provided they enrich themselves jealousies are entertained parties are formed and at last the republic cannot escape ruin instead of which in the monarchy the prince has other interests than those of his state so that it is always flourishing aristotle was asked one day what liars gained they gain he replied never to be believed not even when they speak the truth someone reproached him for giving alms to a wicked man it is not because he is wicked 
that I feel compassion for him, he replied, but because he is a man. He often said to his friends and disciples that science was in comparison with the soul, what the light was in comparison with the eyes, and that the mellowness of the fruit made up for the bitterness of the root. When he was angry with the Athenians, he reproached them with neglecting their laws and taking care of their corn, telling them they were more anxious for good living than good conduct. Being asked what was the thing that was effaced the soonest, it is gratitude, he replied. What is hope? was the next question proposed to him. It is, he said, the fancy of a man who dreams awake. One day Diogenes presented a fig to Aristotle, who being aware that if he refused it, Diogenes would have some joke ready, took it and said laughing. Diogenes has at the same time lost his fig and the use he wished to make of it he said that there were three things necessary to children genius exercise and instruction when he was asked what difference there was between the wise and ignorant there is as much he answered as between the living and dead he said that science was an ornament in prosperity and a refuge in adversity and that those who gave their children a good education were much more their fathers than those who had begotten them since one had only simply given them life but the other had given them the way of passing it happily Beauty he allowed to be a recommendation infinitely stronger than any kind of learning. Someone asked him what disciples should do to turn the instruction they received to the greatest profit. They ought always, said he, to endeavor to overtake those who are before them, and never wait for those who come after them. A certain man was boasting of being the citizen of an illustrious state. Do not value yourself on that, said Aristotle, but rather consider if you are worthy to be a member of such a famous city. When he reflected on the life of man, he said sometimes, there are some who amass wealth with as much avidity as if they were to live forever. Others spend what they have as if they were to die ere the morrow. Being asked what a friend was, he answered, It is the same soul in two bodies. How, said one to him, ought we to behave to our friends? in the manner as we should wish them to behave with respect to us answered aristotle he often exclaimed ah good people there are no such things as friends in the world he was asked one day why handsome women were better liked than ugly aristotle replied you ask me the question of a blind man when he was asked what advantage he had experienced from his philosophy he replied that of being able to do voluntarily what others do through fear of the laws it is said that during his stay in athens he was very intimate with a learned jew who instructed him in the science and religion of the Egyptians, in which knowledge all the world at that time went even to Egypt itself to be instructed. 
aristotle after having taught in the lyceum thirteen years with great reputation was accused of impiety by eurymedon priest of ceres the remembrance of the treatment socrates had experienced on a similar accusation terrified him so much that he determined to quit athens directly and retire to chalcis in euboea some say that he died of grief there at not being able to understand the flux and reflux of the Euripus. others add that he precipitated himself into the sea and said in falling let Euripus swallow me up since i cannot understand it and lastly it is asserted that he died of colic in the sixty-third year of his age two years after the death of alexander the great the inhabitants of stagira erected altars to him as a god aristotle made a will of which antipathes was executor he left a son named nicomachus and a daughter who was married to the grandson of demaratas king of lacedaemon End of section 22section 23 of lives of the ancient philosophers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org lives of the ancient philosophers by francois fenelon section 23 xenocrates succeeded spusippus in the government of plato's school in the second year of the 110th olympiad he governed it twenty-five years, and died in the third year of the 116th Olympiad. Xenocrates had been deemed one of the greatest philosophers of the ancient academy, and was distinguished for his probity, prudence, and chastity. He was a native of the city of Chalcedonia, and was a son of Agathenor. From the earliest years of his youth he was the disciple of Plato, to whom he attached himself so strongly that he even followed him into Sicily to the court of dionysus the tyrant xenocrates was amiable and studious but somewhat dull when plato compared him with aristotle he used to say that one wanted a bridle and the other a spur at other times he would jokingly say with what horse must i yoke this ass xenocrates was also serious and very severe so that plato sometimes said laughing at him xenocrates pray go and sacrifice to the graces xenocrates passed his life in the academy when he entered the streets of athens which seldom happened all the vicious young men of the town were waiting his approach to torment and insult him he had to endure the most artfully concerted trials the most skilful snares and the most seducing artifices such is the empire which may be gained over the passions that he was invulnerable to the most pressing temptations phryne had laid a wager that she would subdue the austere xenocrates one day when he had drunk more than usual she entered his house elegantly attired but notwithstanding the great length of time she remained with him she could not succeed in her enterprise full of resentment to see her presumption frustrated she endeavoured to hide the disgrace she fell by uttering sarcasms which are but too often the weapons of the wicked and the weak xenocrates was very disinterested alexander sent him one day a large sum of money xenocrates took but three attic minae and sent back the rest he said to those who had brought him the present alexander has many people to support he must have occasion for more money than i antipater wished to make him a similar present xenocrates thanked him but would not take it whilst he was in sicily he won a crown of gold as a reward for having distinguished himself at a drinking match he would not profit by it 
but as soon as he returned to athens he deposited his crown at the foot of the statue of mercury and consecrated it to that god to whom he often presented crowns of flowers one day xenocrates was sent to king philip with several other ambassadors philip feasted them and gave them magnificent presents he also granted them several audiences and influenced their minds so greatly that they were ready to do whatever he pleased xenocrates was the only one who refused to share the gifts of philip and who was never present at any of his feasts and would not even appear in the conferences he had with the others when they returned to athens they published that it had been useless to send xenocrates with them as he had been of no service whatsoever the people were discontented on hearing this they were even thinking of making him pay a fine xenocrates discovered in what manner things were going on and cautioned the athenians to be more careful than ever of the affairs of the republic for that philip by his presence had so seduced the ambassadors that they were all devoted to his interest but that as for himself philip had not been able to prevail upon him to accept his gifts the contempt which the people were beginning to feel for xenocrates was now suddenly converted into esteem he was everywhere talked of philip acknowledged openly that of all the ambassadors that were sent to him xenocrates was the only one who had distrusted his presence and would not accept any during the war of lamia antipater made several of the athenian prisoners xenocrates was deputed by the republic to negotiate their deliverance with antipater when xenocrates arrived antipater wished to begin by making him dine with him before they settled anything xenocrates replied that the feast must be postponed for that he would not eat until he had terminated the business on which he had been sent and delivered his fellow-citizens antipater was moved by the attachment which xenocrates evinced for his country and immediately sat down with him and examined the case antipater admired greatly the abilities of xenocrates the affair was promptly decided and the prisoners restored to liberty when xenocrates was in sicily dionysus said to plato someone will be taking off your head for you xenocrates who was then present answered that will never happen until mine is taken off another time antipater being at athens bowed to xenocrates xenocrates who was then delivering a discourse would not interrupt himself and only answered antipater after having finished what he had to say when the philosopher Speusippus, nephew and successor to plato in the academy found himself old and infirm and approaching his end he sent for xenocrates and begged him to take his place xenocrates accepted it and began to teach publicly when any one came to his school that knew neither music geometry nor astronomy he used to say my friend go from hence for you are ignorant of the foundation and of all the charms of philosophy xenocrates espied glory and pomp he loved retirement and every day passed several hours in private the athenians had such a high idea of his probity that one day having appeared before the magistrates to give evidence in some matter as he approached the altar to swear according to the custom of the country and what he said was true the judges arose and would not suffer him to do so telling him that his swearing was useless for they believed him on his word polemon son to philostratus of athens was a very debauched young man one day he premeditatedly entered the school of xenocrates in a state of intoxication with a crown upon his head xenocrates who was then lecturing upon temperance so far from interrupting himself continued his discourse with more force and vehemence than before polemon was so affected by it that from that moment he renounced all his debaucheries and made a firm resolution to reform his past misconduct he executed it so well that in a short time he became very clear and succeeded xenocrates his master xenocrates composed many works both in prose and in verse one of them he dedicated to alexander and another to Hephaestion. as he cared for no one he made himself several enemies in the republic the athenians determined to find him or to cause his death demetrius of phalaris who was held in great reputation at athens brought him and restored him to liberty and managed so well that the athenians contented themselves with sending him into exile xenocrates being eighty-two years of age fell one night against the basin which stood in his way and immediately expired 
He flourished under Lysimachus in the 102nd Olympiad and had taught in the academy 22 years. End of section 23《Section 24 of Lives of the Ancient Philosophers》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by Francois Fenelon Diogenes Part 1 Diogenes died in the first year of the 114th Olympiad at the age of 90. He was therefore born in the third year of the ninety ones to Olympiad. Diogenes Vicinic, son of Isesius, a banker, was born at Sinope, a city of Paphlagonia, about the ninety ones to Olympiad. Isesius was arrested and confined in prison. As soon as he arrived, he went to Atisthenes, who, having resolved never to take on another disciple, endeavored to discourage him and repulse him with a stick. Diogenes, not in the least irritated by this, stooped his head. Strike, strike, cried he. Fear nothing. You will never find a stick hard enough to send me away whilst you are speaking. Antisthenes, at length subdued by the obstinacy of Diogenes, agreed that he should be his disciple. Diogenes was obliged to live in poverty, as a man banished from his country, and who received no assistance from any place. He saw one day a mouse running about briskly without fearing to be surprised by night, or troubling itself to seek a lodging, or even without thinking of its food. This consoled him under his misery, and he resolved to take example by the mouse, and live quietly without troubling himself for the future, and to be satisfied without those things which were not absolutely necessary wherewith to support life. He doubled his cloak so that by wrapping himself up in it, it served both for a bed and covering. His whole furniture consisted of a stick, a wallet, and a ball. The two latter he always carried with him, and only used his stick when he traveled, or when he was indisposed. He said that real cripples were neither the blind nor the deaf, but only those who had no wallet. His feet were always bare. He did not wear sandals even when the ground was covered with snow. He also wished to accustom himself to eat raw meat, but in that he never succeeded. Having bagged a person he knew, to give him a small room in his house to retire to sometimes he had to wait so long for a positive answer that he had recourse to a tub which he rolled before him when he wished to remove his place of abode and never afterwards used any other shelter in the heat of summer when the sun scorched the earth he would roll himself in the burning sands and in the middle of winter he would embrace statues covered with snow to accustom himself to suffer without inconvenience the extreme of heat and cold. He despised the world, and treated Plato and his disciples as spendthrifts and epicures, and called the orators slaves of the people. He said that crowns were marks of glory as fragile as bubbles that burst as they rise, and that spectacles were the marvel of fools. In short, nothing escaped his satire. He ate, spoke, and lay down in all places and at all times, just as inclination prompted him. Sometimes, viewing the porcho of Jupiter, he would exclaim, Ah, the Athenians have indeed built me a fine place to take my meals in. He often said, When I look upon the teachers, physicians, and philosophers in the world, I am tempted to believe that man by his wisdom is raised far above the level of beasts, but, on the other hand, when I see the soothsayers, interpreters of dreams and man whom riches and honor are capable of elating, I cannot help but think they are the most foolish of all animals. One day, as he was walking, he saw a child drinking out of the hollow of his hand. Diogenes was ashamed of himself. What, said he, do children know better than I the things they can live without? And instantly taking his ball from his wallet, broke it as a utensil that was useless to him. He praised exceedingly those who, having been on the point of marriage, had then changed their minds, as well as those who, after preparing everything for a voyage, remained on shore. He did not estimate less highly such as had been chosen to govern the republic, and refused to engage in it, like those who, having been invited to the table of kings and lords, yet preferred returning to plain fare at home. He only studied morality, and entirely neglected all the other sciences. He 
His wit was keen, and easily confuted the objections that were raised against his philosophy. His opinion concerning marriage would have revolted the least civilized tribes of savages. He not only rejected the religious and civil contracts, but even attacked the natural contract of unity of choice. He thought there was no harm in taking anything he wanted. He did not wish people to afflict themselves about anything. It is much better, said he, to console than to hang oneself. One day, beginning to speak upon an important and highly useful subject, and seeing everybody pass by without troubling themselves to listen to what he was saying, he began to sing. Numbers of citizens directly assembled in crowds around him. He then reprimanded them severely for running from all sides for trifles, when they did not choose to listen to things of the greatest importance. He was astonished that critics should torment themselves to discover the misfortunes of Ulysses without paying any attention to their own. He blamed musicians for taking so much trouble to tune their instrument instead of attending to their minds, which required so much more care. He satirized astronomers for amusing themselves with contemplating the sun, the moon, and stars, without knowing the things at their feet. He was not less severe upon orators, but thought only of speaking well without caring how they acted. Strongly censured certain avaricious men, who, wishing to appear very disinterested, praised those who despised riches, yet thought of nothing themselves but amassing money. Nothing appeared to him more ridiculous than those men who sacrificed to the gods for the preservation of their health, and then, as soon as the ceremony was finished, feasted and gave themselves up to the greatest excesses. To conclude, he said that he met with many who tried to surpass each other in foolishness, but that not one had emulation enough to be the first in the road to virtue. Diogenes, observing that Plato, at a magnificent repast, only ate olives, asked the reason why he who pretended to be so wise did not eat more freely of the delicacies for the sake of which he went to sicily i generally live when i am in sicily replied plato on capers olives and similar things as i do in this country of what use was it then said diogenes to go to sicily are there neither capers nor olives in athens as plato was one day entertaining some friends of dionysus the tyrant Diogenes went to his house, and putting his dirty feet in a handsome carpet, said, Thus I trample on the pride of Plato. Yes, Diogenes, replied Plato, but it is with greater pride. A certain sophist, wishing to show Diogenes the depth of his wit, You are not what I am, said he. I am a man. Consequently, you are not a man. That reasoning would be true, answered Diogenes. If you had begun by saying, You are not what I am, since then you must have concluded that you are not a man. Being asked in what part of Greece he had seen wise men, he replied, I have seen many children in Lacedaemonia, but as for men, I can find them nowhere. As he was once walking in the middle of the day with a lighted lantern in his head, he was asked what he was looking for. I am seeking for an honest man, answered he. Another time he began to cry in the middle of the street, O oh, men! Ho, ho! Numbers of men immediately surrounded him. Diogenes drove them away with his stick. It is men, said he, that I am calling for. Demosthenes, dining one day at a tavern, saw Diogenes pass, and hid himself directly. Do not hide yourself, said he, for the more you hide yourself, the farther away you go into what you ought to avoid. He saw another time some strangers who were come to see Demosthenes. Diogenes went straight ahead to them, and laughingly said, hear hear look at him well behold the great orator of athens diogenes was one day in a magnificent palace where gold and silver abounded after examining its beauties he began to cough and spat upon the face of a phrygian who was showing him the palace my friend said he i did not see a dirtier place to spit on one day he went half shaved into a room where some young people were rejoicing that they obliged him to depart after ill-treating him. Diogenes, to punish him, wrote in a piece of paper the names of those by whom he had been struck, and walked through the streets with a tie to his shoulders to make them known, and disgraced them to the world. One day a notorious rogue reproached him for his poverty. I have never seen anybody punished for being poor, said he, but I have seen many a rogue hung. He often said, 
that the most useful things were commonly the least esteemed, that a statue cost five thousand crowns, whilst a bushel of flour was not worth twenty pence. One day, when he was going into a bath, he found the water very dirty. After bathing here, said he, where do we go to wash? Diognis was once taken by some Macedonian near Caronia, who carried him directly to Philip. The king asked him who he was. I am the spy of your insatiable avidity, replied he. Philip was so pleased with the answer that he gave him his liberty and sent him back. Diognis thought that wise men could never want anything, and that everything was in their power. To the gods, said he, all things belong. The wise are friends of the gods. Between friends everything is common. Consequently everything belongs to the wise. It was Diogenes who, whenever he wanted anything, said he would ask his friends for it. When Alexander was passing through Corinth, he had a curiosity to go and see Diogenes, who was there at that time. He found him sitting in the sun, in the cranium, mending his tub with glue. I am the great king, Alexander, said he to him. I am the dog Diogenes, replied the philosopher. Do you not fear me? continued Alexander. Is there any one who fears what is good? asked Diogenes. Alexander admired the wit and unrestrained manners of Diogenes, and after conversing some time with him, said, I see, Diogenes, you are in want of many things. I shall be happy to assist you. Ask me for whatever you want. Stand a little on the side, then, replied Diogenes. You prevent me from feeling the sun. Alexander was very much surprised at seeing a man above everything human. Which is the richest, continued Diogenes, he who is contented with his cloak and wallet, or he whom a whole kingdom does not satisfy, and who daily expose himself to a thousand dangers to augment his dominions? Couriers were indignant that Alexander paid so much honor to the dog Diogenes, who did not even move a step. Alexander, perceiving it, turned and said to them, if I were not Alexander, I would be Diogenes. As Diogenes was passing through Aegina, he was taken by some pirates, carried him to the creed, and exposed him to sail. This did not at all affect him, he did not even seem to consider it as a misfortune. Seeing a person named Zenid, very fat and well dressed, you must sell him to me, said he, for I see he wants a master. As Zenid approached to bargain for him, he called out, Come, child. Come and cheapen a man, being asked what he could do, he replied that he possessed the talent of commanding men. Herald, said he, proclaim in the market that if any one wants a master, he may come and buy me. Those who had the selling of him, having forbidden him to sit down, what does it signify, said Diogenes, fish are bought in any posture, and I am astonished that when not even the lid of a cattle is bought without first striking it to see if the metal be good, Yet in buying a man, it is thought enough to look at him. When the price was fixed, he said to Zainade, As I am now your slave, you have only to prepare yourself to do as I wish. I shall be your physician and steward. Therefore it does not signify whatever I am your slave or free. You must obey me. Zainade gave him his children to instruct. Diogenes took great care of them. He made them learn by heart the finest works of the poets, with an abridgment of philosophy, which he confessed expressly for them. He likewise made them exercise themselves in wrestling, hunting, riding, drawing the bow, and slinging. He accustomed them to drink simply, and to drink only water, and wished them to forego all superfluities whatsoever. He took them with him in the streets, neglectantly dressed, and often without sandals or tunic. The children on their side loved Diogenes very much, and took particular care to recommend him to their parents. Whilst Diogenes was thus in slavery, some of his friends interested themselves to procure his release. You are fools, said he, you are laughing at me. Do you not know that the line is never the slave of those who nourish it? They, on the contrary, are the slaves. One day Diogenes, hearing a herald, proclaimed that Dioxipi had conquered men in the Olympic Games. My friend, said he, rather say, slaves and unfortunate wretches, it is I who have conquered men. When he was told that he was old and ought to rest, what, said he, if I run, ought I to slacken my pace near the end of the course? Would it not be better to make the greatest efforts at such a time? He saw a young man one day who was walking in the streets, and who, having dropped some bread, was ashamed of picking it up. 
Diogenes took up a broken bottle and walked with it through the city to let him see that no one ought to be ashamed of being careful. I am like good musicians, said he, and leave the original air for the sake of the variations. A man came one day to be his disciple. Diogenes gave him a ham to carry. The man, being ashamed to be seen with it in the streets, threw it down and went away. Diogenes met with him some days afterwards. What, said he, has a ham broken our friendship? So one day a woman prostrated before the altar, in such a manner as to be exposed behind. Diogenes ran to her. Are you not afraid, my good woman, said he, that the gods who see behind as well as before should see you in an indecent posture? When Diogenes reflected upon his life, he said in jest that all the curses that are invoked in tragedies had fallen upon him, that he was without house, city, or country, living merely from hand to mouth that he opposed firmness to fortune, nature to customs, and reason to the troubles of the soul. A man came one day to consult him as to the time at which it was most proper to eat. If you are rich, said he, eat when you like, if poor, when you can. The Athenians begged him to get himself initiated into their mystery, assuring him that those who were had the highest places allotted to them in the other world. Yes, truly, replied Diogenes, it will be very fine for Agesilaus and Epaminondas to stick in the mud, whilst your poor, forlorn, initiated wretches should be wafted to the fortunate islands. It was his custom to perfume his feet, and when asked the reason, he said that the smell of the perfume, when put in his head, was lost in the air, instead of which, when he perfumed his feet, it mounted to his nose. End of section 24.